Hi, my name is Syra. Hi, my name is Victoria. And hi, I'm Christina. Whether you're joining us from Zoom or Facebook Live, we would like to welcome you to St. James Presbyterian Church, where we are touching lives through Jesus Christ. Welcome. welcome. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the first Sunday in the Christian calendar year. And we invite you, wherever you are, to begin this journey with us together. You will find our words on the screen so that we can usher in God's presence together and center ourselves as we begin the lighting of our Advent candles and our call to worship. O oh, Holy One, we light this first candle, a candle of grief. In the midst of the stories of the last year, let it burn through these weeks as a beacon to become the light of hope. Let it guide us to your presence in our midst, leading us to your justice and joy in the service of peace. Together, God be with us in this light of hope. And after such suffering, we go searching for a sign, any sign. The sun seems to dim, the moon fails, the stars fall. We need a sign, any sign. Be aware, stay awake, change is coming. We hope that the human one is on the way, gathering the faithful from the four winds into a place of peace. We need a sign, any sign. Be aware, stay awake, change is coming. Nature once offered signs to depend on. The fig tree put out tender, put out tender leaves and we knew summer was near, but climate today is hurting and unpredictable. We need a sign, any sign. Be aware, stay awake, change is coming. So together we search for a sign of the one who is coming. Clarity and confusion, a green shoot in a barren landscape, song arising in a weary soul. Be aware, stay awake, change is coming. Come, let us worship. Come into our midst, O Holy One, rider of the clouds of heaven, surprising answer to heartfelt prayer. In whatever way you choose, come shake us up. Help us find you at work in our lives, showing the way to make all things new. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, St. James. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. Two of the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as we decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there the thrones for judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. 
able to see you at work, in our lives, and in our communities, in our churches, in our homes, in our schools, and on our jobs. Oh, yes. God, show yourself mighty and show yourself strong. We thank you for this church. We thank you for our pastors. We thank you for the leadership of this church. God, we ask you to continue to lead us and guide us so that we can continue to touch lives through Jesus Christ. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. The Wednesday Night Bible Study with Rev. Frank Dew returns on Wednesday, November 18th for Advent season. Join us on Zoom from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. as we explore Advent expectations. You can find the Zoom link and information in your e-blast. We can't wait to see you. Please join us for our Wednesday prayer and devotional at its new time of 12 noon beginning on October 14th. You can join us on Zoom or by dialing in. The Zoom link can be found on your weekly e-blast or either on the St. James website. For those dialing in, you can call 929-205-6099 and enter meeting ID 819-350-1649. Four nine five, followed by the pound sign, and then enter the passcode 820, followed by pound sign. Please join us this week as we seek God's will together. It's given time, St. James. We thank you for all that you do. And today we are collecting an offering for pennies for hunger that goes to local efforts to combat food insecurity as part even of our Matthew 25 pledge to eradicate poverty. And also, you have the opportunity to give to our regular tithes and offering today. However way you give, be it financial, be it with your time and your talent, we do thank you today. Amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Let's bow for a word of prayer as we open the God, word of God once again. Most gracious and all wise God, we come before you once again to say thank you for this yet another day. God, thank you for another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we ask now that as we turn to your word, that you would open our hearts, minds, and ears to receive a word that comes from you. God, we ask that you would uh, take this, your servant, hide me behind your son who was slain on the cross of Calvary so that I may not be seen, but he may be glorified and exalted. God, I ask you to take the words in my mouth and meditations of my heart. Allow them to be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and redeemer. It is in your son Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. And we all said together, wherever we are, amen. Amen. Well, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy and righteous name. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. There's a word that I want to share with us that comes from the Old Testament book of the prophet. Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1. I want to pull apart two verses for us um, that will center us into the message, and that is verses 5 and verse 12. Verse 5 and verse 12. I'll be reading this morning from the New International Version. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning at verse 5 and then going down to verse 12 actually uh verse 6 rather verse 6 verse 6 and verse 12 this is what the word of god says it says behold i am raising up the chaldeans or the babylonians that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to squeeze to seize dwellings that are not their own verse 12 says this lord are you not from everlasting my God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Such is the reading of the Word of God. For just a few moments, I want to talk simply upon this subject, an unboxed God. An unboxed God. It was in the 1914 publication of Sam Lloyd's classic Cyclopedia of Puzzles that appeared for the first time what came to be known as the Nine Dot Puzzle. This puzzle consists of nine dots that are arranged in a three by three grid, and the objective of the puzzle is to connect all nine dots by drawing four straight continuous lines through that pass through each of the nine dots without lifting the pencil from the paper. Although the directions seem pretty straightforward, achieving its objective has proven to be a quite a, com a complex task for many who were introduced to the puzzle for the first time. I'll even confess that it took me several attempts to crack the puzzle before I discovered the secret to its success. You see, in order to master the puzzle, one must occasionally draw lines outside the confines of the box that has been created by the dots themselves. In other words, the box that is created by the dots is only a figment of the imagination since there aren't any actual lines that connect the dots. In other words, the key to finding success with the puzzle rests in one's ability to think and see outside the box. This puzzle paints a wonderful picture of the ways in which we handle challenges in life. There are times when we create boxes that don't exist or we choose to remain in boxes that are meant to be challenged. What often prevents us from growing into the person we aspire to be or achieving the goals that we set or fulfilling the purpose God has bestowed upon us is the mindset we have on that which is possible. It goes without saying that our mind has unprecedented power in the grand scheme of human life. You see, our minds can either take us on journeys where the sky's the limit, or it can keep us grounded without taking any steps forward. 
This is why I believe the United Negro College Fund uh, had it right when they said that the mind is in fact a terrible thing to waste. Although there are many outside forces that prevent us uh, uh, or that present barriers to our possibilities, the most powerful barrier are, are, that we will face uh, are the ones that we place in our own minds before even beginning our journey. You see, we convince ourselves of the things uh, that we cannot do, or uh, we persuade ourselves that things are just impossible. Oftentimes, we forfeit the outcome before even having taken a chance to succeed. Uh, most of the time, this is due to our unwillingness to go outside of our comfort zone and explore the realm of possibilities because change is often accompanied by discomfort. And such is the case. All I'm trying to suggest to us this morning is that oftentimes we keep ourselves boxed in and because we are comfortable in the box that we are in, we fail to explore the realm of limitless possibilities. And such is the case with our relationship, I've come to suggest, uh, is, is the case with our relationship relationship with God. I believe I'm right when I say that the ultimate objective of our faith, at least while on earth, is to arrive at a place where we come to know God better. Now understand, we cannot nor will we ever come to a place where we know God fully. It is impossible to know everything there is to know about God while we are on this earth. That's why you have to be careful of dealing with these uh, uh, know-it-all Christians that know everything there is to know about God because the Bible tells us that even God said, Behold, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. In other words, there is no way you can understand everything there is to to know about God. But what God does is God reveals glimpses of God's character to us and thereby we come to know God more fully today than we did yesterday and then we will come to know God more fuller tomorrow than we did today. In other words, every day we wake up is another opportunity for God to show off more of his character. In other words, God simply says this, you think you've seen all I can do yesterday? Wait until you see what I can do today. Matter of fact, you think that what I can do today is everything I can do? Wait until you see what I have in store for you tomorrow. Our faith beckons us to seek understanding of God that makes improvement upon what we already know of God in the present. In other words, you should never grow comfortable in your relationship with God to the point that God becomes so familiar with you that your mind cannot be blown away by God's abilities. That's why Paul said it like this. In Philippians 3 and 10, he says simply, I want to know Christ. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the participation of his sufferings. God told Isaiah to tell the people, listen, behold, I'm doing a new thing. He says, forget all that stuff about the past. Yes, uh, we, can, we can look uh, to, to the past to know uh, uh, how we can predict May, how God may act in the future. But sometimes God goes outside of the past uh, experiments. God goes outside of the past behaviors that he has done in order to show us a new thing. 
God is the God of newness. That's why we can't box God in. We can't think just because we've come to be fam have familiarity with God that our familiarity will breed a familiar expectation of God. That because God has done something one way for so long, it does not mean God can't act brand new and start switching up. And so, my brothers and sisters, that's what I've come to declare to us this morning. I've come to declare to you that it is good for us as followers of Christ, it is good for us as children of God to open our expectations of God and to unbox God from the box that we have placed him in. God cannot fit into our boxes of understanding. God cannot fit into a box of tradition nor religiosity. God cannot fit into a box. You cannot reduce God to a box because our God is bigger than the box. I've come to understand that there are times in our lives where our God is too small. God is too small. That's why we don't take chances. That's why we don't step out on faith because we have a small God. But when you have a big God who, it's, who exceeds your expectations, when you have a big God who is bigger than anything you can ever imagine, then that's when you live a life on faith that says, I'm going to walk to my destiny. I'm going to pursue my my goals I'm going to accomplish some objectives because I serve a big God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ever ask or think I want to suggest to us this morning that's a problem that the prophet Habakkuk had right here in the text. In this portion of the text, I'm going to hasten on. I ain't going to be before you long. In this text, Habakkuk is a prophet, and he's a unique prophet, because most of the times, prophets would share a word from God to give to the people. But instead, Habakkuk does the complete opposite. opposite. Uh, Habakkuk is bringing complaints from the people to God. He's serving more so as an intermediary, a, a middleman between uh, God and God's people. And he's taking the com complaints that many people would uh, share with Habakkuk. He's taking these complaints directly to God. He opens up his prophetic oracle by simply saying this. He says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? He's frustrated with God because of the things that's going on about him. He says, um, I cry out to you saying that there's violence, but, but you don't save. Uh, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? He says, destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict that abounds. He says, the law has been uh, paralyzed and justice never pre prevails. The reason why is because he says, the wicked surround the righteous and therefore justice is perverted. He's looking at the conditions that's going on in his country. And he's complaining because every time he turns on the news, the news brings bad news. Somebody's been shot. Uh, somebody has broken into somebody else's home. Uh, uh, somebody is making false claims that the election has been rigged and, sh and votes uh, have been stolen and went from one side to another and therefore he wants a recount. Yeah, uh, he every time he looks at his community, he he's looking at a state of economic disinvestment. Every time he looks at the history of his community, he sees where his community had been the victims of redlining, and it seems like God has been silent about what's been going on in the community. So he's complaining. He's saying, God, I need you to show up. I need you to show that you are God. I need you to deliver us from the situation that we are in. So he takes the complaint to God. 
And then he has an expectation from God. He expects that God is going to change the situation. That's a good expectation to have. I want you to understand that you should never stop expecting God to be able to change and shift your situation. We do serve a God who is far able and qualified to be able to change situations. I brought a couple witnesses with me. Uh, there's two sisters by the name of Mary and Martha. They can testify that when Jesus showed up, their situation changed because he called their brother Lazarus up from the dead and uh, he, he raised him up from the dead and because he showed up, he shifted and changed their situation. I wonder is there anybody out there who can testify today that I've had some moments when God has shown up in my life and I've come to discover that every time he shows up he shows out. He showed up on my job and now all of a sudden everything's going well. He showed up in my finances and have taken me from being broke and wondering how I'm going to make ends meet to where now I'm able to uh, sufficiently budget and be able to pay all of my bills. He's shown up and mended my broken heart. He's shown up and eased my troubling mind. Is there anybody out there who can testify that God can show up and show out and when he shows up he shows out by shifting and changing my situation. Watch this. He's complaining to God about what's going on but then watch this. God answers his complaint. And God simply says this, what I'm about to do, Habakkuk, is going to blow your mind. I'm not lying. Watch this. Verse 5 simply says this. Uh, it says, uh, th this is the Lord's reply. It says, look at the nations and watch. Observe. He says, be utterly amazed. He says, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe. That's a prophetic word to somebody. I don't know who needs to hear this. But God is able to blow your mind. God is able to work work and in such a way that even you won't believe it but watch this I know that's good news for us but it's actually strange news for Habakkuk because the reason Habakkuk won't believe it is because of what God is going to do in verse 6 verse 6 he says this you won't believe what I'm getting ready to do because watch this I am raising up the Babylonians. Some translations suggest that it's the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were a group of people who lived in southern Mesopotamia, in the southern Mesopotamia area, in what is now known as Iraq. Uh, these were a group of people who were farmers and lived an agrarian life of agriculture. And uh, over time, they were victims of injustice because as the area started becoming more urbanized, they extended the borders of urban society and treaded upon their agrarian lands and so as a result they started forming these different coops and they would rise up and fight against these injustices that have taken place against them but watch this Habakkuk doesn't focus on that Habakkuk just focuses on this simple fact God is raising up a people whom he considers to be an enemy God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. I'm raising them up. And watch how even God describes these people. He says, they are ruthless and impetuous people. They are feared and dreaded people. He says, they are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. They, they're self-interested. Uh, they are only interested in their own selves. He says, watch this, their horses are swifter than leopards, uh, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops uh, headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. These are people who are some strong-willed people, but they're using their strong will in a wrong direction. They are causing destruction all about them. These are the people 
who are responsible for taking over the Assyrian superpower. Uh, you understand in Old Testament history that the northern kingdom of Israel was overtaken and enslaved by the Assyrians. So these people have come in and have overtaken, have, have overtaken the oppressors to the northern kingdom of Israel, thus making them a political superpower of the day. Go and teach Bible, Reverend Hughes. I'm doing the best that I can. And, and, and they have taken these people over. But watch this. Habakkuk says, wait a second, God. I just complained to you about the issues I'm facing here in Judea. But you're saying that the answer to my problems comes from an outside group who is an enemy and furthermore who are a people that don't know you and your holiness. Watch what Habakkuk says. He says this, Lord, are you not from everlasting? He's questioning God's, uh, uh, God's identity. He's questioning whether or not God is still the same God that he had been taught as a child. He's questioning whether or not God is still the God who he had been hearing about from Bible stories, by attending Sunday school, from going to church. He's wondering if this is the same God that his pastor had preached about. He says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. He says, Lord, Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. You have placed them to execute judgment. Uh, you, my rock, he says, you have ordained them to punish. Uh, he's saying this. He says, uh, you have given them a place in the grand scheme of your plan. Uh, you have put your hand on some people who don't even know who you are. They don't know you. They don't respect you. They don't worship you. They don't come to church. They don't serve in ministry. As a matter of fact, they are atheists. Uh, they, they don't even believe in who you are. He says this, furthermore, how are you using them when your eyes are too pure to look on evil? You can't tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? He says, why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those who are more righteous than themselves? In other words, Habakkuk is at a crossroads in his faith because for so long, he has only understood God to operate in a box. That God is the God of the Israelites. God is the God of the chosen people. Mind you, he's a Jew. And, and for him, his religion has informed his self-esteem by suggesting to him that he is a member of a chosen race of people that God has specifically chosen to be a royal priesthood. And so as a result, he views himself as chosen. He views himself as being favored by God. If God is going to raise up anybody, it would be people who look like him. If God was going to raise up anybody, it would be people who have the same cultural background as him. But right here, God contradicts his understanding because God starts to raise up somebody else who is not a part of the chosen group of people. Mm. This may get me in trouble, but that's all right. But I've come to suggest to us that we must be very careful about how we consider ourselves to be chosen. And we must always remember that everybody who's put on this earth is a product of God's creation, which inevitably makes them a child of God. I don't 
care if they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life or not. I don't care if they don't come to church. I don't care even if they are racist. It does not justify our willingness to look down upon them just because they don't have the same connection to God that we have. Just because they don't have that same connection and relationship to God doesn't mean that God is not still their creator and it does not mean that they are not a child of God because I heard the Bible say that God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. See, so many times our box of understanding God, what it does is it limits God's power. For Habakkuk, he thinks that because God only deals with people who are like him, that that uh, now God is doing something new. And so now he's wondering, God, are you still the same powerful God that you said you are? He, he doesn't believe that God has the power to use somebody who is different than him. If God can't use them, that means God is not powerful. One of the ways in which I know God has power is because God uses some of the least likely of people to accomplish his will. I know God has power because I'm the one standing before you preaching this morning. I, 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 I'm not one who comes from a great pedigree. I'm not one who has the world's riches. I'm not one who knows everything there is to know. But yet, one thing I do know is that God has placed his hand on me. And the only reason I'm standing before you preaching this sermon is because God's power shows me. And the only reason you're doing what you're doing and the only reason and you're at where you are and the only reason why you're where you are in life is because God has put his hand on you and God's power overcame you and enables you to do what it is that God has called you to do. God demonstrates his power by choosing those people and things who are considered the least likely. I know I'm right about it because watch this the greatest demonstration of God's power was through his son Jesus Christ who Paul says thought it not robbery to be equal with God but gave up divine status and privilege and came down and wrapped himself up in flesh and, and did it in the form of a slave and as my old pastor would say he downloaded himself into time so that we may be uploaded up into eternity that is the power of God God is so powerful that he came way down just so we could go way up but we have a limited understanding of God and so as a result we have put God in a box and then the, what, the, what the box does for us then is it first of all limits God's power for Habakkuk he's like God you can't use these people because you're holy and they're wicked but God is saying this don't I have the power to use who I want to use? Don't I have the power to call up who I want to call up? So many times we make the mistake of uh, trying to confirm what God has already ordained and sometimes can contradict what God has already purposed in eternity past. What I'm saying is uh, we think that you know sometimes we are unwilling to confirm certain people because we know their background we are unwilling to confirm and affirm certain people because we know their history we're unwilling to confirm what God is doing through some people because we know some things about them but sometimes God says I've already chosen them despite all the evidence that suggest otherwise despite the fact that when you run their background check and it comes up and they shouldn't be doing what they what I've called them to do God says this my grace is still sufficient God's hand right here in this text 
is on a group of people who were outside of what they understood to be the covenant. And God is saying, I'm so powerful that I can use people that you look down upon. I am so powerful that I can use people whom you think that can't be used. I am so powerful that I can use somebody that you feel like can't share a word with you. Just watch my power get put on display. That's why we in the sanctuary. Y'all not tip out when your favorite preacher ain't preaching. That's why when somebody shares a word with you, you ought not just throw that word away because of your disdain with the person who gave you the word. You don't know who God could use to bless you at any moment. Not only do we limit God's power by putting God in a box, but also not only does the box limit God's power, but the box limits possibilities because of our established precedents. What I mean by that is this. Because we've gotten so familiar with God, and, 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 and I told you earlier, one of the main objectives of our faith is to become familiar with God. But not to a point where we're so familiar with God that God gets predictable. But we should get familiar with God to the point to where we understand what God is able to do and leave room for God to blow our minds. Habakkuk was used to God using a certain group of people. Habakkuk was used to God doing certain things. To where now, when God was getting ready to do a new thing, even God had to tell Habakkuk that what I'm getting ready to do, you won't even believe. And the reason you won't believe is because you've gotten so comfortable in the box that you've placed me in. And now I'm about to do a new thing. And now because I'm doing a new thing, I need you to open up the horizons of your understanding. I need you to broaden your perspective. I need you to open up the limits of what is possibility. Because in order for me to do a new thing and in order for you to believe, you must see that there there are enough there is nothing that is impossible with me that through me I you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you that because of me no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper that because of me there are no limits to what I can do he says look out and you won't even believe what I'm going to do because you're looking for a precedent you're looking for something you can point to in the past that uh, aligns with what I'm doing in the present. And God is simply saying, there is no precedent for what I'm doing now. There is no paradigm for what I'm doing in the present. I just need you to have faith to suggest that what I'm doing in the moment will benefit you in the long run. And you may not see it right now because of uh, your comfort zone. You may not see it right now, but trust and believe that I'm working everything out for your good. He says, you're not going to believe it, but I'm doing it. And I've come to tell somebody that there's going to be some moments in your life that God is going to do a new thing in you, but your ability to receive it depends on you taking God out of the box. What box do you have God in this morning? What boxes have you gotten comfortable in? And I want to ask you this question. Can you challenge yourself to take God out of the box? I promise you, God will blow your mind. You know, I was thinking about one day, uh, I went back home uh, to Kentucky and one of my uncles, uh, he got a new car. Um, since the last time I had been there. It was new to me because it was the first time I saw him in the car or I saw the car that he had. But, you know, it was kind of old to him because he had it for, for some time. 
And this is a new car. This is one of my older uncles. And he's up in age, but it's a new car. It's a sports car. And it was a pretty nice car. And I asked him, I was like, Unc, you know, what, what's an uh, old player like yourself doing with a car like this? You know, you don't need this type of sports car. You need something that's, you know, just a little bit slower and more comfortable and a little safer for you. And, you know, I was teasing him about it. But then, you know, we took the car out for a test drive. He let me drive the car around. And in that sports car, uh, in this car that he has, there's a mode in it that's called sports, uh, sport mode. Uh, you see, when you put the car in drive, it's normal like any other car just drives, but there's a sport mode in it. And that sport mode, what it does is it changes the uh, the way in which the engine works to where now the RPMs go up just a little bit higher. And in that sport mode, there's also a section in it called slap shift, uh, where you know the car is an automatic, but you can put the, the stick over to the side and it lets you do it as if it's a manual. I wonder if some car lovers that know what I'm talking about in here. And not only does it let you do it on the stick uh, that, that, that's on the, uh, the body, but it, there's these two little panels that's in the steering wheel. And you can change the gears while on the steering wheel. So while we're driving this car, I'm doing all this stuff. And my uncle's looking at me like, what are you doing? I was like, you said I can test the car. He said, but but what's all that stuff that you're doing? And I broke it down to him. He simply said this. He said, out of all this time I've been driving this car, I had no clue it could work like that. And there's somebody in this place that I'm talking to today that you've spent so much time with God and now you can say that when God is doing a new thing, you can say, I didn't know you could do all of that. I've come to tell you that whenever you try God, whenever you test your faith and your faith gets tested by God, then it opens up your horizons to understanding God and what God can do. And then you will arrive to a place where you can say, God, I didn't know you could do all that. God, I didn't know that you could really heal even though I've seen you do it for some other people. I've never seen you do it to me before but now I understand that you're a healer. God, I didn't know you can do all that. God, I didn't know that you can really be put bread on my table and bring me some manna from on high. God, I didn't know that you could really ease my troubling mind. God, I didn't know that you can mend my broken heart. God, I didn't know you could do all that I've come to tell you when you unbox God God can do all that <laughs> God can do exceedingly abundantly more than you're able to ask or think make the decision today to take God out of the box so that you can see God in his fullness let's pray God we thank you for your word we thank you for the reminder today that with you all things are possible and there are no limits to what you are able to do. God, it was strange for Habakkuk because he was looking for a precedent. It was strange for Habakkuk because he was looking for paradigms. It was strange for Habakkuk because he had limited your power. Help us and teach us to not make the same mistake of putting you in the box that limits your power, that searches for precedence because you are able to do a new thing in our lives. Help us to test, your, test our faith and to grow and to be open to the challenges that come when we take you out of the box. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray and give thanks and all the people of God said together wherever we are, amen. Well, thank you for tuning in this week. I pray that the message uh, was uplifting and inspiring to you. And so right now, I want to take this opportunity to make a special invitation. There may be someone out there who has heard this message and has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Listen, I want to invite you right now to give your life to Jesus uh, and give your heart to him. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that offer still stands today. So I want to extend that invitation to you if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. 
please do it today. 2020 has taught us that tomorrow is not promised. All you have is right now. So please, ma'am, please, sir, please, sibling, comment in the Facebook Live comment section or send a message in the Zoom chat section. And also, if you don't have a church home, we would love to connect you with St. James Presbyterian Church. Um, please also uh, comment in the Facebook Live comment section or send a message in our Zoom chat section and we will be in touch with you. Once again, thank you for tuning in this week. We hope to see you again next week. Let us now receive the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth now and forevermore. And we all sit together, amen. God bless you. Once again, thanks for tuning in with us this week. We hope to see you again next week.